Hi, welcome back to Wild Speculation. I'm Daniel. I'm Scott. This week, we talk about Laura's one shot, the long anticipated. <laughs> uh, did you do a rewatch? I did not. Okay. I did. Okay. Uh, not as thorough. It was more background than normal. Okay. Um, but. I think my favorite part of the episode mm -hmm. was okay. Well, first thing I have to say is once again, Travis is our avatar on the stage <laughs> because I think of all of them, he was the most proud of her. Yeah, he definitely was. Um, and that was sort of well and I think of all of them he also may have been into it more than any of the other ones yeah uh, I mean Liam dove in right. but uh, yeah I think how uh, how do I want to word this how uh, genuinely upset do you think Travis was when Sam admitted he hadn't read anything? See, he already knew about Harry Potter because they talked about that. Sam's mentioned it multiple times. I was really shocked that he hadn't seen Breakfast Club. I mean... Yeah. For me, growing up in the 80s, I, I'm i still just in the mindset that everybody's seen The Breakfast Club. <laughs> I mean, it's a classic. It's like yeah. saying somebody hasn't seen The Goonies. Yeah. I mean, even people who aren't familiar with uh, Hughes' other work, yeah, they've seen that one. Yeah, that's like the one they've seen. That or 16 Candles. Yeah. Even though you know, you've also got Weird Science and... You know, yeah, all of them. Anything set in Shermer, Illinois, <laughs> is John Hughes. Just don't go looking for it, like Jay and Silent Bob. Yeah. <laughs> I was just about to say they even reference it in Jay and Silent Bob. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think. My her her opening and everything and and whatever ritual they have around that, which we don't largely get to see. Right. Uh, I think was uh, was great. Um, I loved yeah I loved her opening and I don't know see. Okay, so real quick, we knew as soon as the cameras came on that it was a Harry Potter. Yeah. How quickly did you catch that it was going to be Breakfast Club as well? The third character introduction? See, I caught it, like, in the first character introduction. Because everyone's gone, they're in detention, and oh, all of well, a sudden the redhead, I'm like, it's Breakfast Club. I actually think I started thinking Breakfast Club when she was saying, you five. I'm like, holy crap. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that yeah. And I'm like, Sam's Molly Ringwald. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it... Well, you say, when did I know? Uh, and it was by the third inter introduction. Okay. Um, but you're right. It was like detention at Hogwarts, redhead. Yeah. Um, and it's, even though they were showing the art, like I was seeing those actors yeah. in in a lot of, at a lot of points in the beginning there. Yeah. I'm like, oh, Molly Ringwald. Oh, Brian's Michael Anthony Hall. 
Yeah. Uh, Me and Zowie Sheedy. Um, yeah, I couldn't place, like, why I was so excited the first time, I couldn't put my finger on it. Um, which is one of the reasons why I did the rewatch. Um, and the reason I was so excited, and Travis's excitement mirrored mine, Good. was my joy at watching a new Game Master yeah. start. Yeah. Um, because I don't remember my first games as a Game I, Master. I don't remember mine either. Um, I know they were around 87, 88 yeah. for me. Um, and mine was the early 90s. But... Yeah. yeah. Um, and I've run so many that... Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so that's that's why I was so excited. And, and I, I had the same level, same kind of excitement for Travis. Mm. And... Sam. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever see Ashley run a one shot? My heart wants to say yes. <laughs> but your brain wants to say probably the, the, not. The, the cynical side of my brain is saying no. It's um, kind of where I'm at, too. Yeah. Um,. So one of the things that struck me um, during the episode, especially when Brian thanked Ashley mm. for helping him with his cleric build, yeah, I was like, well, he knows Yasha's backstory. Like he knows elements of it that nobody else does. Right. Why don't they get him to Jaeger her? That's true. I think, I don't know, it seems to me like they have a no Brian during the actual campaign kind of rule, and I think it's because of talks. I buy that. Because they usually have the guest star on, yeah. and he can't interview himself. I buy that. Um, so... That's kind of my gut feeling about why he's never been on except for one shots. Yeah. And so my brain just defaults to that's why he's not a green, actually. Yeah. I mean, but like if he did, it would it would get around a lot of the issues we talked about last episode. That is true. Um, yeah, he knows pretty much because he said he knows the whole and yeah. actually so him actually and Matt are the only ones that know the whole backstory yeah um, and the rest of us don't know enough now I could also see it like the other side of why he hasn't done it is because of the temptation that he has admitted that he has to just spill everything yeah and well, that would certainly please the audience. Right. Uh, uh, I don't know if it would be as satisfying an RP moment. Yeah. Uh, and well, and it could be a mix of both of those reasons. Yeah. So, one of the things that I have to admire Laura on this episode. Okay. Uh, she kept it tight. Yeah. And planned out two encounters. Yeah. Um, I am always ambitious when I plan one shots, and I try to to plan out at least four. Uh, they have inevitably never gotten there. Um, or the players go off on a tangent yeah. that I didn't anticipate, and I'm making shit up. Yeah, that's how it normally happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, all 
also one of the things that I loved about her. I don't know if you want. I don't know if I want to call it style or development, but she used a property that most everybody was familiar with, mm -hmm. and that everyone had love for. Yes. Whether or not they could say it on the stream or not, mm -hmm. everybody knows it's Harry Potter. And I have maintained that the best way to get someone into role playing games is to find their franchise. Yeah. To find their universe that they love. A lot of them have their own systems. Yep. Um, if you don't want to learn a new system and you're comfortable with a different one, you can easily hack it. Yep. Um, or at least get it close enough that no one bothers to yeah. question. Um, well, like Laura did. Yeah. Circle of the Moon drew it for an animagus. Yeah. Um, that was the other thing I really enjoyed about the reveal of the characters. Yeah. And the play is very easily they could have all been wizards or yeah. sorcerers. Um, they didn't do that. Yeah. We had uh, Spider Eldritch Knight. Yep. Uh, that was Talison yep. playing Emilio Estevez. Uh, we had a sorcerer. We don't know what subtype. Yeah, we do not know. Um, my feeling is Storm. Okay, I can see that. Um, just because of the different elemental types that he was throwing out. Yeah, I was gonna say either. I was gonna say probably Storm. The, uh, the other one I thought maybe, but there wasn't any evidence for it. Just because of it's them, was the Room Child yeah. from Caldore. Yeah, I don't think that would that would come into play. Like, I I think if it had been that, we would have seen evidence for it. But that was a thought that initially popped in my head. I wonder if they can use that. Yeah. Um, cleric? Yep. Which was... Knowledge domain? I was going to say thinking... either... I, I was thinking knowledge, but also maybe the arcana domain. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. Um, he never channeled divinity, so... Right. Which is um, the giveaway. Yeah. Um, wizard... Yep. And the ward. Who was the wizard? She was Conjuration, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I think that's the divine transposition. Yeah. Um, although, she didn't cast a Conjuration spell either. That's true. Um, that's true. Anyway. Uh, let's see, and then and the druid. Yeah. Um, and I like that. I, uh, I especially like that there was two divine-based casters in the park. If you consider druid divine, druid I think is a fine line. Uh, mm -hmm. Since fourth edition, especially. They're lumped in as nature casters, as primal. Yeah, historically they are divine casters. Um, but yeah, that was interesting, and I like uh, Liam using Shillelagh. Yeah. Um, and he was the only one that had armor. Yeah. Um, not even the fighter. Why do you think that was? Because we didn't really get into it. Do you think that's to reflect her leather jacket in the Breakfast Club? Probably. If it's going to be reflective of that, yes. The character, yes. It's going to be reflective of the players because he's plugging a wizard without armor. <laughs> in the main <laughs> game. Yes. Yes. 
Um, yeah, that could also be it <laughs> for sure. Um, I think what what else, other observations? I, oh, she kept it tight. Two yep. encounters that she had planned. She covered all the bases of Harry Potter, really. Yeah, of, of the, the Harry Potter story. The creepy defense against the dark arts could be the villain teacher. The creatures that run amok inside the school. Mm -hmm. The giant spiders. Mm -hmm. uh, wizard chess. Yep. And Filch. Yep. Uh, although, uh, all of her uh, school staff were all female. Yep. Which I thought was interesting. Um, where I think a lot of people, like with Rowling, it's almost the exact opposite. Statistically, she has more male teachers than your average school would. More than your average school, but I think there's still. I think it's just that the male teachers are feature prominently in the story. Feature prominently in the story. Because of Harry. I buy that. Uh, Snape and Flitwick, and you know the defense changes every year, yeah. but because uh, you've still got. Um, McGonagall and Madame Hooch and Professor Sprout yeah. and Trelawney, the divination professor. There's multiple, you know, yeah. numerous, numerous women teachers. Yeah. They're just more background characters than anything. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, I loved the, the, the wizard chess encounter. Yeah, I really liked that. Uh, so much so that I was like, how can I do this? And I have some ways that I might have done it differently. Yeah. And see, when they were doing the wizard chess encounter, I was thinking, is Mac going to make them play Battleship for a naval encounter? <laughs> That's where my mind went. Well, Battleship would be easier than Midway or Flat Top, for sure. Well, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that would be cool. Uh, yeah. Or you could do... So, this is going to go off on a tangent. Okay. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, early days of D&D, &D, I had Legos. Mm -hmm. And me and my buddy would build fleets of ships. Okay. And we he had an, uh, a computer bar. And I had a skull being held by a hand with snakes. It was also pewter. They were roughly about the same weight. Okay. And we would toss these pewter weights at our Lego models in rounds of combat. Okay. To destroy and sink them. Okay. Uh, that would be cool to see them do that. Yeah. As well. Something like that. But, yeah, digress. Um, and this is the second time we've seen them bring games in, though. Because Marisha in the Honey Heist. Yeah, used uh, the icebreaker. The Don't Break the Ice. No, don't break the ice. So. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think that might be some of that could be their the influence of dread. Yeah. yeah. Um, Using Jenga as a storytelling mode to Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think like I think what would have helped the players in that encounter was for her to explain up front. Uh what the rules of the encounter were. Yeah. Um, rather than having them sort of muddle through. Yeah. Um, I think also what she could have done is taken five pieces off the white side. Yeah. 
yeah, because that's what happened in Harry Potter. There yeah. was two missing pieces, and one of the knights didn't have a rider. Yeah. Um, and I think that would have helped them. Oh yeah. Get into the flow of it better, whereas they basically sort of she put them on the chessboard, and then Travis is like, "I'm gonna step forward," and then after he did, the chess piece moved. Yeah. Um, whereas if there would have been those, and I, I think she did it that way to let them pick any piece they wanted to be, rather than say you have to be one that. of these five pieces. I can see that. No. Uh, but yeah. You you know the other thing that it could be, and what I would be tempted to do if I was doing something like that, if say your character had dragon chess as a tool proficiency, I would explain to you the game. The others may mm. not know it, and yeah. then you would have because, and that's what happened in Harry Potter. Yeah, Ron. Harry and Hermione didn't know the game, but Ron did, and he was explaining it to everyone yeah. and took control. Yeah, and I would do that. I would I would find a game that matched one of my players' tool proficiencies if possible, mm. and then let them kind of. I also have assistant to, DM. I also have to say that. Uh, I enjoyed the slight bit of terror, in Sam's demeanor. Yeah, when he's like, the five of us are going to have to play Laura in chess. <laughs> which may, leads me to believe that she has a reputation as being a good chess player yeah and the moves that she was making were pretty good moves yeah and when she made bad moves she said this is a bad move but Claire is going to do it yeah so like I enjoyed that uh, aspect of, of the encounter um, from the player GM side thing. Um, golems? Do you think those are the stat blocks she was using for the chess pieces? Strong golems? I think so. Um, so, one of the things I wanted to talk about in that encounter mm -hmm. uh, is. She was very kind when Black tried to take their pieces as the players. Yeah. And they didn't attack. It either hit, missed, and if it hit, didn't knock them unconscious, so the piece retreated. Yeah. Um, I think I would have done it a little differently. Yeah. I would have. I would have been nowhere near as nice. Yeah. Uh, basically what I would have done is because the spiders are there as the danger to the players mm -hmm. um, and we saw in the movie that Ron when he's in a, sacrifices himself so that Harry can right. check the king uh, he didn't get hurt really I mean some falling damage maybe yeah. but it wasn't life threatening um but he did go unconscious. Right. So I think having them be paralyzed. Yeah. Um, might have been a better way to do that. Because that would have ramped up the danger to them with the spiders crawling over them. And mm -hmm. now the chess game... And they did try to use the pieces to kill the spiders. Yeah. Um... And the ironic thing is, is if they were playing a good game of chess, it would have been a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of their pieces that they moved, they moved out without defending pieces. Yeah. So there was no coverage um, on their side. Yeah. Um, and if they'd been really clever, they could have tricked the black into attacking the spiders too yeah. um, by uh, tempting the attack right 
where the black like and it, like the idea I had was uh, using either the bishop or a rook from the black to move themselves into a threatening position. The spider follows, but is in the attack line yeah. of that other piece. Um, so that when the piece moves, it attacks the first thing, which is the spider. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking of that too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed that whole thing. Uh, I think she nailed the house elf portrayal. Yes. And... You know, that's the other thing, and I don't think it had the connection that I put on it, but it also reminded me of the uh, Gully Dwarf that Raceland befriends in the Dragon Lots Chronicles. Uh, Bippo? Hmm. Boopoo. Yeah. Boopoo the Gully Dwarf. Um, she kind of she reminded me of Boopoo a little bit. Hmm. Smarter, of course, yeah. but that same kind of just very very afraid yeah yeah um but brave enough to go out and seek help yeah uh the staircase was another one um where i think I think she had an idea, and maybe it was a little more elaborate mm -hmm. on how to handle the staircase. Yeah. Um, and maybe she was nervous about time, because uh, she got nervous about the number of combatants in the first fight, and mm -hmm. it sort of it did take a little longer maybe than she thought. Yeah. So I think she may have been nervous. Well, I think it. it are we talking about the sprite there? Yeah. Yeah, I think that also did more damage. I think it sapped the player for more resources and more hit points than she expected to. I think she was yeah. generally shocked when she thought the cleric was going to go down. There was a bit of worry yeah. in her voice when she was like, did your cleric just go down? Yeah. So, um, I think she she was like, because what but, I read from that was, oh crap, I over. You might be right that that might have been what she was thinking, but I don't think that was the case at all. The majority of their difficulty in that encounter, mm. the dice were not with them. That's true. At all. Well, Travis didn't hit once. Liam didn't hit once. Yeah. Even when, you know, for me, even if it's like, I can be like, part, my, part of my brain will be like, yeah, they're getting that dice rolled. But part of me is like, oh crap, I'm going to slaughter them if I don't pull these guys, bring these guys in a little bit. Well, she did that off the bat, though, because not every sprite went after right. a character. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Sam's character was completely ignored. For that first turn, the sprite for the book, and even when she was casting magic missile at him, one stayed at the bookcase. Yeah. Um, and then one in the office was at the desk tearing stuff up. So, uh, and then one spent a turn tearing up the. Yeah. The tapestry. So, like, she did all those things that a game master can do without fudging dice rolls. Right. To control the deadliness of the, the balance. Counter. Yeah. Um, which is the kind of thing I would have done in that situation. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. Which that's what me... I meant by rain in, not like lessen yeah. their, you know. Yeah. And it's like, part of me wonders why she was so nervous because she did so well. Yeah. Well. And again, we don't remember our first times, but that's true. Generally speaking, and when I've seen people go the first time they are nervous yeah natalie was you know um, Donna. and i mean there's even a lot of people that are nervous their first time just as a player that's true yeah so um, 
And since she had never really played before this, before Critical Role, for the home game. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. But like she said, in the between the sheets, you know, she had heard about it and wanted to play, but she just didn't know anybody who played. Yeah. Never had the experience, the opportunity. Yeah. Um. So I was trying to think of a way to do the staircase. Um. Because she handled it basically as an acrobatics trick. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that staircase is more a function of intelligence and See, wits. Yeah, I would have done intelligence acrobatics to Ooh. figure the timing and get there at the right time. Which would have made them a, probably a little less hesitant. And also more likely to succeed. Yeah. Because I think a lot of them have well. That's what I would have done. Yeah. I would say, you know, like, oh, that'd be that would be a good use of intelligence acrobatics. Yeah. Yeah. She was also very kind when Sam finally did do benign transposition. Yeah. And didn't have him take box. Uh, other than in theory if she is flying up and he jumps and has fallen here transpos transpositions themselves she's still flying so even if he falls she can catch him yeah um, or it gives others time to catch him yeah um, uh, so yeah they didn't I think she was trying to rush to get to the end. Yeah. Um, we know they pre-recorded yeah. the session. So I think somebody had a hard out. Um, Probably. Uh, but yeah. Um, Who do you think was supposed to be playing Brian's character? Because Brian said he got called at the last minute to play him. Uh -huh. yeah, I don't know. Did you hear Matt? I was thinking maybe Matt. Because on the last talks, when they were talking about it coming up, when he was talking with uh, Talos, and he was like, Yeah, I got called at the last minute to fill in. You know, I'm sorry for it. And Talos was like, Oh, you added a lot. You were good. You know? Yeah. That that was the one thing that was I was kind of, kind of in the back of the mind my mind because I remember him having said that on talks last week. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. And Matt did tweet out an apology for saying that he had he wasn't that he couldn't. Well, the way it sounded was like there was no way he could have done it because he was already had an engagement. Yeah. And it could have been like he was supposed to have done it, but then when they all got together to plan the time, he was the one that couldn't make that time frame. Yeah. And they called Brian in. Yeah. Uh, but he and Marisha were both had other things they had to be doing at the time they played. Yeah. Um, more than halfway through. I don't know if there's much more we can say Not about really. the one shot. No. Great job, Laura. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Um, so, do we want to talk what we expect for this Thursday's show. Okay. Okay. Um, so last episode that we left off the Mighty Nine. Yes. They had just finished off the Hydra. Correct. Not and Caleb are still high. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I said that I think we're 
they're going to have to go into that pool. So I think that's the the first hurdle okay. on Thursday mm-hmm. is getting knocked down there. But we already know the fix for that. Caleb Hughes with the four. Does he have the spell slot? That's a good question. Because I don't know that he does. That's true. Or did he prep it? Because that's the other question. He may have the slot, but did he prepare it? Because he didn't prepare Fireball. That's true. And he went with a buff, debuff build for that day. And suggestion is social and control, which I could see him taking the next long rest when they have to right. confront pirates. But if he had suggestion, he could have used it on the Yuan too. Well, calm emotions help Caduceus with his issue. He could try that. Yeah. Again, if Caduceus had prepared calm emotion, right. which, I from an RP would. standpoint, I think that's always in his pocket. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Um, but Caduceus or Ford could just could just try to convince not that it's not water; it's just something she's seeing because she's high. Yeah. The Mariner's armor allows you to cast water breathing once a day, right? Mm, I don't think so. I don't know. I think it does. Which means, in theory, Ford can cast water breathing on everybody. That's true. Um, so it might not be an issue of holding their breath. Uh, to get through there. Um, I think no matter what, Ford's probably going to scout down the hall. And I think it's going to be discovered there's more down there. Definitely. There's definitely more down there. Um, So, we talked about uh, so, knowing the end game of this temple, does Avantic uh, insist on scouting with Fork so that the two chosen are down there without the interference of these underlings that keep Okay, I could see Avantica objecting to the others going down there. Um, in some ways that almost guarantees they'll want to go. Yeah. Um, see, I guess in, in large part it's going to matter if Matt has built this second part as an alternate escape route. Yeah. That this goes down deep into the island and connects to a water source outside. Which is my thinking and how it. Well, I'm almost confident that is how it's built because the way I pictured the dream Ford had, he's entering from that other entrance. Hmm. Yeah. So with that dream, I'm almost confident that that's the way it's built. Hmm. Well, if that's the case, then whatever they need to do is actually in that room, not the light. Because it was in the circular room that Ford yeah. had his reward yeah. vision. Um, <sighs> odds on the Mighty Nine stopping the first seal opening, for lack of a better uh, metaphor. 
my gut says that the first seal is going to get broken. I, I think the first seal will get broken. They'll realize what's happening. And then they'll try to stop the others from being broken. Yeah, I think that's probably the odds on. That, that's my gut. That's what my gut says. Um, uh, they're still they're still too disjointed, too self serving to have that much foresight that that is going to be bad. They're not going to know it's going to be bad. How bad yeah. it's going to be until it hits. And that might be the thing that kind of tempers them a little bit towards that. We need to look at shit. Might be. Yeah, and see, my my thinking is that largely, uh, I don't think that turn is ever going to happen. Not fully, but you know, it's they're going to be like, you know, well, like Bo said, you know, we need to leave places better. That shit probably ain't going to happen either. Yeah, but they're going to be like. We need to think things through a little more. It's That's gonna be cool. that wake up call that they ignore in future well, episodes. Yeah, I think it's gonna be well it, it, if this if it plays out this way it will be interesting, I think. And what I mean by that is Caduceus and not assert themselves as the moral compass. Okay. That Caduceus has an understanding of the poisoning that is happening because that's part of it is his core. And with Yasha backing his play, yeah, uh, in the the fight to cleanse the land, um, be it for good or ill, uh, their personal needs or not, um, I think that's going to end up being what happens. But having the three of them sort of form that base, yeah, puts our leadership. Uh, quote unquote leadership structure in disarray. It does, yes. Because Ford's not going to be in charge. Who doesn't want to be in charge? Uh, this current arc has reinforced that more and more that he doesn't want it. Uh, whether he's good at it or not. Same with Caleb. But Caleb, I think, has realized that if he does take that leadership position, puts him in a better position to accomplish his goals. And I'm still of the opinion both of them want to be the power behind the throne. Yeah, they don't want leadership. They don't want to be up front. But they want to control where the group is going. I think that's more true of Caleb than Ford. I, I think it's more evident in Caleb than Ford, but I don't think it's more true. I and I admittedly have a fairly cynical outlook on Ford. Yeah. Ford is the one character I'm the most cynical of. And I think it stems to the whole to the certain things he's done, the accents, the yeah. you know, my argument that he's not yeah, good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um and I think, and I admit that that has, you know, that has made me cynical of him, and it could be my cynicism, um, but I don't think I'm wrong. You can be cynical and still be right. That's true. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I think Bo is going to be the first one to snap on Avanti. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know if we talked about. Jeez. I don't remember us talking about it last uh, episode, um, where when she's like, "Get one of your subordinates." Yeah, we, we talked to... about it. Whoa. And see, you know, like it, you know. With that, that's like, you know, you take the tongue depressor, the popsicle stick, and you bend, and it starts to splinter yeah. before it snaps. That was that. That was yeah. the splintering. Yeah. So she's, you know, already there ready to snap on her. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. If they take, if that, the way down is a secondary exit, and they take it. 
um, I think that puts them, it will probably put them out close to the lizard folk. Or okay. closer. Yeah. Um, and I still think that letting the Yuan Ti kill those lizard folk uh, was a missed opportunity. Oh, yeah. Um, especially because if they had saved them, they could have allied with the lizard folk to take the mistake. Mm -hmm. Or even the squad. Mm hmm. Um, speaking of the Squall Leader and the mistake, do they try to trade up, do you think? Or do they just blow it? Ford, Caleb, potentially Bo want to trade up. Just or not, blow it. Hmm. Caduceus, whatever, man. I can see that. It's Ford being the sailor, Caleb being the one who's always like, well, we need more power. We need more power. Yeah, but arguably the, the Squall Eater doesn't get them that. Gives them guns. It does. No one to shoot them. Not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Think of all the things she could rig to go out of those with her tinker tool. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I just I don't I don't know. You may be right in that split, but I just I don't see the fight for the squall leader ending with them actually taking it. Um, no, I, I I don't know that it does. I think the that's the intention split. Um, If they go down there, and if the Avantika showdown doesn't happen either in the chamber where they fought the Hydra or further in, mm -hmm. then, I mean, well, you mentioned it last time, that it could be end up being that they part friendly. Mm -hmm. She did accept them as part of her crew. Yeah. Uh, it's possible she just lets them go. Uh, Sailing under mistake. her banner. Yeah. Um, and she tasks them with opening the second temple. Yep. Uh, which. Eh. I mean. Yeah, that's that's gonna be a tough choice, I think. Yeah. For them. Uh, Neither. Yeah. I think. Well. Yeah, the default sort of position uh, is that they are heroes, whether they are good people or not. Um, I think they are anti-heroes and anti-villains. The, They're doing the work of heroes because it's what they need to do to further their goal. They're not doing it with any heroic intention. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to talk about Caleb's end goal, about changing time travel, and how we think Matt will handle that. Um, but I think it's too far off. I think it is. I think it's something we need to to really handle. 
Because we assume Caleb's plan is to stop the murder of his parents. How? Stop or reverse. Yeah, how he plans to do that, we don't know. So here's the, here's my question. They're potentially owed a wish. Yeah. Does not at least one. Does not jump on that. To become not a goblin. Does Caleb jump on that to get the power he needs? Does Ford end up jumping on that to change patrons? I could see that. If they haven't had a knockdown drag out before that moment, mm -hmm. it happens then. Um, if they haven't unified behind a single purpose uh, when they finally go see the nail or not the nail uh, Mirrod? Mirrod um, and, he, and if that is indeed what he offers uh, it happens then yeah um Does Jester take it to empower Traveler? I don't think so. I mean, unless the Traveler whispers in her ear? Because she already thinks he's the you don't be think, all end all. You don't think the situation could go like this? I offer you a wish. Anything you wish. And Jester says, I wish the traveler could be here. Yeah. Or I wish the traveler had more influence. I could. Just out, boom, out of her I mouth. I could also just right out of her mouth. I wish everybody used cinnamon in their bear claws. <laughs> I mean, I see both of those as equal chance of happening. Yeah. Yeah. But honestly, I see more like... I it, wish Ford would fall in love with me. I see her as think, especially if they really get into and it is as it appears in this evil thing that is Ford's patron she would be like Ford this is your chance to be free of that I think at her at her heart she's the closest one to being an actual hero yeah and at her heart she would think of Ford and even the rest of them but mainly Ford first Because to her, the Traveler's already the end-all, be-all. He's already the greatest. That's true. So unless he whispers in her ear, she's not going to think of that. Because to her, I mean, yeah, she's surprised more people haven't heard of him, but... Yeah. I see that. But I see her out of all of them. Well, her and Bo could be... You should use this. This could help you. If they want to go to his palace on the plane of water, we've been going back and forth. Do they go to the water or Sharia or not? Mm -hmm. And 
I think some of the events have made it less likely. And some have made it more likely. Yeah. So I think it's still too up in the air. Yeah, um, it is. Um, but... Do you think we'll find out whether or not Avantika is water or fire? Do you think she opens up more about her backstory to Ford? If they break, so they break the seal, they're together now. Uh, does she reveal her backstory? No. If it happens, it's going to happen after the fact. Back at the ship, if they leave peacefully, they'll meet in her room one more time, and she'll indulge his curiosity and tell him more. Yeah, I'll buy that. Okay. Um, I'm still holding out hope for Kuotoa. Um. Oh, yeah, you, okay. held, you held out hope for that Faye thing for a while, too. I did. But I think the Kuotoa has a little more substance to it. <laughs> but here's... I just thought of this. Okay. The Kuotoa make up their own gods. And they collect trash to build their shrine. And if enough of them believe enough, they can make that god manifest. Okay. What if Jester witnesses it? We know the Traveler has a plan for what we think is the solstice. Mm -hmm. The summer solstice. Does, if, if Kuotoa does not use that opportunity to sort of lay that in, to hint at what might happen. Yeah. I can see that. So that that's the other reason why I'm I'm really jonesing for Kuatoa, because I'd like to see that aspect brought into it. Yeah. Um I think they'll see Kuatoa, I don't think it'll be on this island. I think it'll be when they go to the second temple. It wounds me that you that you say such things that I've thought and have tried to keep silent. But yes, I I'm going to put it out there. <laughs> yes, I think you... I, yeah, you might be right. I, I have to acknowledge that I also thought a similar thing, <laughs> but didn't want to give it voice. Um, what can I say? You're welcome. <laughs> uh, let's see, who else do we... We've got. Not will need to make another explosive arrow if she hopes to make use of Fluffernutter. Because she also, I think, if memory serves, used her last fire arrow in that fight, too. Yeah, she only had one. Yeah. So she'll need to remake that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. Uh, we will probably we'll talk to you guys next week where we discuss episode 40. Yep. Uh, Title to be determined. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go enjoy talks, and we will see you guys next week. Bye, guys.